Welcome to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets, where world-renowned author, speaker, and holistic veterinarian Dr. Judy Morgan answers your questions and offers healthy options for raising your pets in a more holistic manner. Not sure which vaccinations should be given or how often? Not sure what to use for flea, tick, and heartworm prevention? Join Dr. Judy now as she interviews the top experts and showcases the latest products that will help your pets stay naturally healthy. Hello and welcome. You're listening to Dr. Judy Morgan's Naturally Healthy Pets on DreamVision7Radio.com. And I'm your host, Dr. Judy. You can hear my show every Monday and Tuesday at 7 a.m. and 7 p.m. Eastern by going to DreamVision7Radio.com. Older shows are archived on our wall. So today I'm really excited to have a guest who has started a group that is doing amazing things to help people and we all know that my platform is about helping our pets have longer and healthier lives but my platform is also about love love for mankind love for the animals in the world and ways that we can help each other out so my guest today has a business called guardian angels medical service dogs and My guest is Carol, and Carol Borden has, I met her through the Pet Industry Woman of the Year Awards, and she won the 2018 corporate category, and just amazing for the work that she's doing. She also won the 2014 Stephen R. Wise Advocacy Award from the Florida Rehabilitation Council for the State of Florida for work with the disabled community. The 2018 National Vetty Award in the mental health category for our successful for her successful work with veterans was one of six nominees selected for the Joe Sanchez Jr. Leadership Award and one of 30 top finalists out of more than 4,000 applicants for the National L'Oreal Women of Worth Award. She has a book called Ranger: Tales of a PTSD Service Dog, and is now working on or has a curriculum for the Borden Method Pioneering Comprehensive Obedience Training and the Borden Method Pioneering Service Dog Training. Carol, thank you so much for being a guest today and for coming on to tell us about the amazing work you're doing and how people can help you. Well, thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here today. So how did you get started with uh, your work with dogs and training? Was there something in your life that was kind of an aha moment? Well, there was, Judy, but backing way up, uh, people tease me because I say, I think I said doggy before I said daddy. And (laughs) my life life has been filled with animals ever since. My parents had the uh, good uh, forethought when I got my first dog to buy from a breeder who showed dogs and became my mentor uh, and brought me up through the ranks of learning all the right ways and things about dogs. And so dogs were always a huge part of my life as well as other types of animals. Uh, I was a professional licensed uh, handler for the AKC. I did professional uh, obedience training for hundreds and hundreds of classes. And that aha moment came Uh, later in life when I had a young man come to me who was quadriplegic. He had been um, the high school football star at their homecoming game, and in a blink of an eye, a tackle went bad and left him quadriplegic. Wow. But this young man still wanted to live an independent life. Um, I actually met him several years after his accident, and he had this uh, wonderful German shepherd who was totally out of control. And <laughs> <laughs> he came to me just for obedience training, and I said, oh, my gosh, we can, we can train her to do so much more. And so that was actually my very first full mobility dog that I had ever trained for a person with a disability. And as a result, they, um, it, it, that was my wow moment. We went through the mall. Uh, in one of his final tests to see how the dog would help him navigate through the crowds at Christmas time and so forth. And by golly, you know, people must have thought I was nuts because I was several feet behind so that the dog wasn't looking to me for support, that she was on her own to make her decisions. And here I am back here just boohooing, tears down my cheeks. <laughs> and, and that was really my wow moment. 
And on top of that, my uh, son was overseas uh, in combat. And so I said, you know, what better thing to do with my time and my God-given gifts of communicating with dogs and being able to do this? I'm going to look into this service dog thing. There must be more to this. And sure enough, I did. Um, everybody told me it was going to take like a year to get my 501c3 for a nonprofit, and I'd have to go back and forth and do this and that. Listen, I did it all myself, and I had it back in 30 days. And I said, you know what? This is meant to be, and we're uh, just about to start our 10th year. That is an incredible story. And I have to say, one of the things that I talk about a lot on my show is passion. And if your why doesn't make you cry, then your why isn't strong enough. And obviously, your why made you cry. And <laughs> when, you, when you have that passion, nothing will stop you. You become incredibly unstoppable. You will leap hurdles. You will become superwoman or superman. And you know you will accomplish things like getting that six-month-long process done in 30 days. So obviously you saw something and you knew what needed to be done and that there was a huge need. And there is a huge need for this. So oh, absolutely. What, where did, do the dogs... Well, I've got a lot of questions here. So where do the dogs come from that are used for the training? Well, we do, do people bring them. you their own dogs or do you find dogs? No, we don't take their dogs, although we do have a, a separate program called PET. So if a dog at home is showing the propensity for possibly being a service dog, we will put them through a six-month class in our PETS program. Um, but there are a lot of things a dog has to be able to do, a lot of uh, inner um, strength the dog has to have on its own in order to qualify. It's kind of like being the rocket scientist of the human world, and <laughs> not all the rocket scientists, not all dogs can be service dogs. And so predominantly what we do with the dogs that we raise, train, and pair is 20% of our dogs are rescue dogs. And we don't pick puppies. We pick dogs that are a little bit older because their personalities are, um, you know, more apparent what, who they're going to be and what they're going to be like, if they're going to have the nerve and the uh, work ethic for this sort of thing. And um, so... It's very important uh, that the dog have all those right characteristics. As a result, we have about an 80% success program with the dogs that uh, go th that we rescue. The other group of dogs, we do breed specifically for the genetics that we are looking for. We're looking for solid nerve, the work ethic, being physically and mentally sound, um, you know, maturing early, all the different things that we need in a service dog, non-aggressive, et cetera, et cetera. And so we have about a 95% success rate with the dogs that we choose for our own breeding program, whereas we have about an 80% success rate with the dogs that are rescue dogs, which is still a really good average for um, rescue dogs, but we still have the other 20% that don't make it in the program that requires another department to rehome and make sure they are properly situated for life. Absolutely. And so is there a certain breed or a group of breeds that you, that you are using, or is it kind of across the board? Well, you will see some various dogs periodically because um, as an individual, this really boils down to the individual dog. Um, but as a whole, certain breeds were bred to do jobs and to have work ethics. You know, other breeds were bred to be lap dogs and comfort mm -hmm. dogs and things like that. So, yes, our personal breed of choice are German Shepherds. Uh, they've been used for many, many things throughout the decades. Uh, and one of the things most people don't know is German Shepherds were actually the very first service dog ever used after World War I uh, in Germany after they used a lot of the mustard gas. It blinded thousands of soldiers. And they figured out that they could train these dogs to become leader dogs. So the first dog in our country that was actually a service dog was imported from Germany. It was a trained leader dog for the blind. And at that that dog came into our country in 1929. And so um, we've kind of gotten away from German Shepherds because they've been used for so many other things. So 
when you're watching the media, you start thinking of, you know, German Shepherds being police dogs, military dogs, they're pulling people out of bushes, they're aggressive, but that's not everything you need to know about a German Shepherd because it's all about the way they're raised and trained because they're very willing to do what you ask them to do. Our dogs are very high, they socialize, they're very safe in public, they can never present a public safety threat to people or other animals. That's incredible. So the dogs that you're breeding, you're breeding totally German Shepherds. And when you yes. pull them from a shelter, do you pull other breeds or are they pretty much Shepherds too? We will sometimes look at other breeds and even mixed breeds. Um, first of all, they have to be large enough to be able to do the different tasks that they're trained to do. These are not emotional support dogs or comfort dogs. Let's face it, all dogs give some level of emotional support. These are very highly skilled dogs that have to have specific tasks that actually mitigate the challenges of an individual's disability. So they have to be large enough. We don't look at little dogs. Uh, we do look at medium to large size dogs uh, because they have to be able to do mobility work, bracing, balance, shielding, um, being able to open and close doors, turn on and off lights. I mean, there's a lot of different things depending on what that individual needs. We custom train the dog to suit what their needs are. It is incredible the jobs they can do. How long does it take? So uh, you're breeding, and so you have puppies that are on the ground, and obviously they need to spend time, you know, socializing, growing up, doing all that. And I'm assuming you start the training very early. But how long does it take to train the average dog that you get from the shelter, or the average dog, you know, if you bred it and it starts as a puppy, at what age will it be trained well enough that it goes into a home? Those are great questions. Um, it takes about 1,500 hours to get the dog to all the different levels that it needs to go to through because it's not just about the task. It's about socialization, desensitization, the basic obedience, uh, public access hours, and then the final stages, of course, are the task and skill work. We actually start, you, you'll have to think twice about this answer, uh, we actually start working with our puppies when they're three days old. And I know everybody's going to go, oh, that's impossible. Their eyes and ears aren't even open yet, blah, blah, blah. But oh, no, I, I think that that's a great time to start. <laughs> <laughs> well, we borrowed a program from the military. They have what they call their super dog program. And one of the programs that they use under that is the biosensory program, which is a thermal tactile program doesn't do anything to hurt the puppy at all. It's very simplistic. But they figured out from the third to the 16th day of life was the most rapid stage of the neurological system in the canine. And so they use that to their advantage and that uh, they prove that it lowers anxiety, raises their immune system, and raises their intelligence. So we use that for all of the dogs that we raise. And then we start with a continuous loop tape when their ears open, so they're hearing all kinds of sounds that they're going to hear as they get older. And interestingly enough, we actually train without any equipment. Uh, while it is required that a dog wear a collar and leash legally, we call those our legal ornaments. <laughs> because we want, dog, we want the dog to respond to their person and not have a need because people have seizures, people become incapacitated. We don't want them to have to depend on equipment. We teach our dogs to think. They are not necessarily command-based, nor are they you know, trained to respond uh, to man-made equipment. They have to be Johnny on the spot, whether they're in public or at home, and ready to help. So are these dogs getting into a home within a year? Does it take two years to get them to the level that they need to be? And is it different depending on what kind of person they're going to be supporting? Well, it does um, because it depends on the number of tasks that they have to learn. If it's a very simple olfactory skill like um, diabetes, seizures, um, anxiety, nightmares, those are easy to teach the dogs because those are based on chemical changes in the individual and we teach the dogs what those things are that they need to respond to. And um, But a lot of the people that we see have multiple disabilities. And so we may have someone who has PTSD, a TBI, seizure condition, maybe mobility um, handicaps along with that. And so we teach the dog all of those things. And each one of those is an individual task, which means the training time will take longer. If it's a simple task, 
we're probably looking at about 1,500 hours. Um, the German Shepherds are usually mature enough to go between 15 months, 14 months to two years. If it's something that requires more training for additional training,